Uh, good evening, everybody. And I see we have a very nice crowd here tonight. And it's our pleasure to be back at Rat Pack after um, maybe a year or two um, since our last presentation. And Dan, I think that you guys are doing a great job. You have these weekly presentations and you know, I know personally how difficult it is to get speakers and how much work that takes because in our club, we run uh, just about every day um, a forum that demands an outside speaker and it's tough. So for you to keep this going with interesting topics, um, I salute you and thank you for having us back. Um, okay, um, why don't I just introduce myself briefly and then we'll go around the room here. Um, Howard WB2UZE. I've been involved with CW since 1965 when I got my license as a novice, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Long Island CW Club. And today I'm pleased to have along some of our trust, trusted senior members. Mike N1CC, you want to say a few words about yourself? Sure, Howard. Thanks. I'm Mike N1CC. I uh, have been uh, a ham since 1974. I joined the uh, Long Island CW Club in uh, 2019, and uh, I am part of the team that uh, helped build the uh, academics for the club. And I'm Jim, W6JIM. Uh, I live in California. I've never met Howard face to face yet, but uh, I've been part of the club since also since 2019, and I've been a ham since 1996, and I've been pure CW since 2006. Well, you know, Jim and I and Mike, we've been on Zoom just about every day for the past three or four years. But finally, we're going to meet each other at Dayton uh, next month. And that's going to be very exciting. Jim, I know you're very tall, so I'm going to be not shocked by that. You know? <laughs> All right. All right, let's get going. Okay. Let me do my sharing stuff here. a primitive form of communication known as Morse code. You're right. I'm at a lot of practice. Uh, that's an S. A T. A. N. Uh, D. End of word. Stand. New word. B. A. Um. C. K. Back. Stand back. Stand, Stand back! back. That's um, a new um, entree that uh, Jim has made for our presentation. And I was listening to the CW a little bit closer this time. The fist, whoever was doing that, um, sounds like one of our beginners. <laughs> it's kind of choppy, but it is, it is real. It was the real letters. Okay, so we've made the introduction and um, what we're gonna be talking about today is how to have fun uh, and a, in a new way of learning Morse code. So let's get started, Jim. Okay, why would anybody want to learn CW in today's high-tech world when there's very efficient communications like um, digital FT8 um, and so on? Well, what we see lately is there's a tremendous demand for people to do soda and poda, parks on the air, summits on the air. And we all know that if you were gonna go on top of a mountain, it would be a lot easier to bring along a CW rig than a sideband rig or even a digital one that would need a computer because a CW rig these days can be as small as a pack of cigarettes and have five watts and get out fine. And it does very well with compromised antennas. Easier to set up. So it's really the mode of choice for outdoor operations, which is very popular now, and that's driving a lot of young people uh, to want to learn CW. Another issue we find is that, you know, people are a little tired these days of having every single thing at their fingertips on their phone. And CW is a very efficient yet romantic way of communicating and it draws a lot of people to it. It has um, an allure to it. And another driver is that we find 
that since CW is no longer forced on us to get our license as it was 20 something years ago, um, a lot of hams are saying, well, you know, now I want to learn it because I don't have to. It's something I'd like to do. And a lot of these same people are becoming retired now and they have more time in, in their uh, later part of life and they want to learn CW. So there's a lot of factors. These are some of the, the main three, but um, there's a very robust resurgence in CW now. Okay, what's next, Jim? Well, you know, uh, there's lots of different ways that you can learn CW. Um, first way would be self-study. I actually learned through self-study myself. If, uh, if anyone out there like me, maybe listen to a bu uh, Gordon West. He made a bunch of cassettes and CDs. And uh, I remember I just got married in 1996, and that's when I started learning CW. And my wife uh, still talks about it to this day. I was listening to those tapes morning, noon, and night. Um, but also, you can take formal classes. You know, in the LICW, that's what we do there. We teach informal classes. Um, what is it? CW Ops also teaches informal classes. And I bet there's a lot of ham clubs around the country that teach uh, classes on CW. Um, you can uh, just jump right on the air and you can just start listening. And you, that's another way to learn. Um, that's how I learned. I learned through half self-study, then just jumping on the air, and then just listening to what they did and trying to figure out what the back and forth was and how it worked. Um, but no matter what you pick, with daily practice and uh, and you're persistent, you can be successful. Yeah, that's right, Jim. And um, I learned from a 78 record, which I still have. Huh. And it worked. And the main, the main thing is to be able to get on the air as soon as you can. Okay, straight key or paddle, um, which is recommended? Which should you learn with? Well, if you put this question out on qrz.com or any other um, a ham forum, you'd get 10,000 answers and it would drive you crazy just reading them all. But what's our take on it? We believe that you should learn with a straight key. And why? We feel there's a better mind to hand connection if you're making the dots and dashes yourself. When you use a keyer, the electronic device is really making the CW for you and you're using a different part of your brain. As far as bugs go, um, they're complicated instruments to develop a good fist on and we like our um, students to wait till about 18 words a minute before they start using that because at 18 words a minute that's about the speed that you're knocking on the door of head copy and um, also about the speed that if you're using a straight key it's becoming cumbersome and tiring on your wrist so we think after 18 words a minute um, you're welcome to use a um, uh, keyer and a bug but the bottom line is are we cast in stone on this and the answer is no um, this is our recommendation but the final decision on what to use when you're learning is yours okay Jim Fear of CW. Um, the, the fear of CW is actually what brought me to the club. Although I uh, started in 1996, I took a few years off um, while my I was in the military for 30 years. And towards the end of my career, got things got really busy. And I just had to put something aside. And it turned out to be my ham radio hobby. So when I retired in 2015, after about a seven-year break, I came back in. And I could, of course, I could remember the... Uh, the, the letters and, uh, and everything I'd learned as far as the characters go. But for the sake of, for the life of me, I could not remember the proper QSO protocol, you know, the language or the sentence structure you use when you're going back and forth. And so I joined the club to, to get brushed up on that. Now, we found that whenever we uh, started growing, that that fear of CW on the air uh, is not, wasn't just for me, but it's for many, many people. And we absolutely understand it. You know, whether it's from making mistakes or not knowing the protocol or uh, just not knowing all the characters, um, we know how to fight it. We have the cure. And what that is, is first, it's really a three-step process. It's uh, through camaraderie. You know, we have classes where you're, you're learning with a peer group um, as you're moving through the classes. So you, you build friendships. Um, education is at number two. And that's where we teach you, first, of course, the characters. And then we teach you as you get into a QSO, 
what's going to come at you on the first exchange and what to expect on the second exchange and what's expected of you whenever it's your turn to send. So that education takes away all the, the unknown. So that takes away that, that fear. And then um, most important of all, number three, is that we keep it fun. We keep all of our classes fun. And so um, with that three-step process of camaraderie, education, and fun, we found to have a great success in breaking through this, this fear barrier. What do you think, Howard? Well, you know, as I always say, uh, when I got in the air in 1965, uh, we were young. We were in high school, uh, junior high, as a matter of fact. Nobody at that time was afraid to get on the air. I didn't know that there was a deep fear of people getting on the air with CW. But I found this out very quickly when we started the club five years ago. And I said, oh, my God. I said, we got to do something about this. So we basically engineered the entire club to be able to combat that and make people feel secure and safe so that they would be ready to take the leap when it's time. Okay, Jim. Well, um, kind of why, why is it important to get on the air? And it is very important. Um, and it's kind of what I just talked about earlier about that fear, because the longer you wait to get on the air, and if you're waiting because you're a little afraid to get on the air, the longer you wait, the more that fear is going to kind of build up and more anxiety that's going to increase in you. So we found that once you get on the air, we, we have lots of different um, classes and in, in, um, um, that are designed to get students on the air to kind of break the ice, so to speak. Um, once you get on the air, then that opens up the whole world of, uh, of ham radio, whole world of, of on the air CW QSOs for you to practice with daily. And then that's really where you start to really, really exponentially improve. Now, um, I spoke a little bit earlier about uh, how we teach what's expected, what you're expected to send and when and what's supposed to come to you on whatever, on the first exchange and the second exchange. And we call that QSO protocol. Um, CW is very structured. Uh, whenever you get into a QSO, it's very structured. And, and for me, being 30 year military uh, a person, um, I like structure and I like uniformity. And so really what you find in the first and the second exchange is almost cookie cutter for what you're going to hear. Once you go beyond that, it gets to really interact you. But we teach you that. We have classes that teach the protocol. We teach not only um, standard QSO protocol, but we teach protocol for SKCC QSOs. We teach protocol for um, SST QSOs or even our, our own LICW challenge and, and others. Um, whenever it's done right, and whenever the operator, uh, the person sending knows the protocol and the person receiving, there's that back and forth. And that's why we have this back and forth slide, because it's really like beautiful music. I, I like to think of uh, when I think of a perfect QSO where each operator knows what they're doing back and forth. Um, it's like a perfect tennis match that never ends. You know, no one misses. They keep on hitting it back and forth and back and forth. Or if they're if they're QRQ going really fast, think of it as uh, Olympics, Olympian uh ping pong players, right? Back and forth and back and forth. But I also like to think of it like if you've ever seen a, a dance couple doing a ball, ballroom dancing, those professional ballroom dancers where, you know, it's not just one, they both have to be matching what they're doing back and forth. So whenever I hear a really nice QSO on the air, to me, it's like listening to beautiful music. Howard, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree, Jim. And it's the same thing if you were speaking another language or foreign language, let's say you're speaking Spanish, you're not a native speaker. And the other person is speaking very clearly and uh, distinctly, and you can understand them well. Um, your own Spanish will kind of mimic that and and be in sync. So it's the same thing when both CW operators, as Jim was explaining, are in sync. It really is a beautiful thing to hear. Okay, Jim. Mike, why don't you take this? Well, head copy is sort of the holy grail of uh, of CW. It's what everybody really uh, strives to achieve. And it's uh, the ability to do what we're doing right here, is just to have a conversation as naturally as, as this. Uh, the advantages, of course, you don't have to write something down and then go back and read what was uh, copied. You're able to communicate in, uh, in real time and retain the meaning of what was said. So Mike, um, just briefly, how, how did you incorporate this into the new curriculum? The entire intermediate and advanced curriculum that we're going to speak to here in a little bit is, uh, as far as we know, the only comprehensive and structured approach to achieving conversational head copy. We're very excited about it. 
Yeah, Mike did uh, a lot of work on this to bring this down uh, at the uh, beginning level even so that we could start introducing head copy. Head copy is a very personal thing. Um, the reason we have this ticker tape up here is because when I head copy, I actually envision that. Um, I envision uh, actually a number of pathways at the same time, but not everybody does it that way, and it's a very personal thing and um, something that is not the easiest thing to teach, but we spend a lot of time uh, developing this into our curriculum. Okay, Jim. Speed. Well, um, I'll, t I'll take this one. Um, you know, often when we get people into the uh, club, they, they come in wanting to get faster. In fact, almost everybody wants to get faster when they're coming in. But then some ask, you know, how fast is fast enough? Um, and do I need to be faster? Well, the truth is, is that, um, you know, you can have wonderful QSOs at 10 words a minute. You can have wonderful QSOs at 15, 20, uh, 24, and 30 words a minute. It's really up to the individual how fast they want to get. And um, if they do want to get faster, we have we have processes and classes within our club that uh, teach teach just that, just in, in the increasing, over increasing uh, uh, speed for you to increase your um, instant character recognition. And then, as Mike was speaking to, um, Mike, how did you put it? It was a conversational, conversational head copy. Conversational head copy. So you know, whenever you, and whenever you're first starting out, you're writing things down. And then as you reach a certain speed, um, even if you can write really fast, eventually you're going to, you're going to not be able to write as fast as what, what uh, the copy that you're receiving. So uh, we can, t we, our club covers everything from the beginning all the way up to fast. But, um, you know, for me, um, I know Howard, everyone has their own speed that they're, they're comfortable with. I like to go around um, 18 word, 18 to 20 words a minute to me is a nice, comfortable speed to operate at. And I know, Howard, you're on a diff little different scale. What, what's your speed that you like to operate? Well, I, I operate at 24 words a minute. And, and why, you know, 24, not 28, 20, 22? At, at 24, it's still um, fast enough to, to uh, clip along. But I still can keep the CW in my subconscious mind, Jim. I can take a phone call. I could balance my checkbook. I could read the Time magazine at the same time and still not to have to really concentrate on the CW book. When you start getting up in the upper 20s into the 30s and higher, um, you're using a different part of your mind and you really have to be focused and concentrate and you certainly can't do two things at once. So 24 is a very comfortable speed and there's still plenty of operators that will answer your CQ if you are sending at that speed. Higher than that, um, uh, you're getting into contest speeds and things would drop off. How about you, Mike? What, what speed do you like to send at now? Oh, I find 23 a perfect conversational speed. As uh, Howard said, it, a very loose focus with very little effort. It's just very, very natural. Faster speeds than that are fine, but it does require a bit more focus. All right. See, sure so we got three different speeds. And then I'm all, and all of us are always happy. I hear Howard all the time uh, whenever he, we do the, uh, or we operate in the SST contests, and I think you never operate past about 13 words a minute. Is that right, Howard? Uh, I never, in, in the SST, where for those who don't know what that is, is a slow speed contest uh, a few times every week, uh, sponsored by the K1 USN Club. And um, I, I will never um, turn up the key or pass 13 words a minute. Even if somebody calls me faster, they're going to get 13 words a minute back from me. And that's to um, encourage all the other um, uh, new operators to have the courage to call me. Okay, so we're uh, just about uh, midway of the uh, first part of our presentation. And the next areas that we're gonna talk about are overstudy, copy skill, uh, plateauing, sending and expectation management. And anybody who knows me and some of the people in the club, as you can see, we are big Star Trek fans. <laughs> and I like this thing that Jim picked up. It's from uh, uh, the Kunit Calafee, if everybody knows about it that when uh, uh, Kirk has to fight Spock. So go ahead, Jim. Overstudy. Well, uh, we get a lot of people coming into the club that are real excited and want to, you know, jump right in head, head first. 
and which is great. We, we want that, but at the same time, we don't want we don't want anyone to overstudy to the point to where they're going to burn out. So we tell people to pace themselves and not to not to not to do too much on you know maybe not as much as what I did. I used to listen to the the code when I was learning. Uh, I, I, all day, I would, listen, I would listen to it when I'm driving in the car. I would listen to it uh, when I when I went to bed at night. I put on headphones, thinking that maybe while I was sleeping, it would seep into my my brain. That wasn't too good for my marriage, and and so you got to have a balance. So uh, we want you to avoid burnout. Um, there's so many apps. Um, there's so many websites out there. There's all kinds of places, and and which is great. Um, there's there's lots of wonderful resources out there. But since we have these cell phones with us all the time, you could find yourself, you know, spending all your time on on your app. But you got to have some breaks in between. You got to have some time for your mind to rest and process what you've been doing, right? So um, that's we that we're just warning with this one. We want you to use those resources. We want you to use the websites and apps, but we don't want you to burn out. Um, and we also don't want you to forget your goal, which is getting on the air. So while you're using those things, we don't want you to get so wrapped up in them that you forget that hey. Um, I'm getting really good at this, you know, it might almost become like a game to where, hey, I'm getting really good at this computer program. But, uh, you know, remember to, when you get good enough, time to step away from the computer, time to turn on your radio and time to get on the air. Howard? Did we lose Mike here? Yeah, my hotel Wi-Fi wasn't so good, but uh, I'm back. Well, he's back. Okay, I don't see him, Mike. I hear you, though. I, I see him. Oh, you do? Okay. All right, yeah, I mean, uh, as Jim was saying, getting on the air, uh, that's very important. We like our students to get on the air within three and four months, um, even even if they don't know um, the complete uh, character set. Uh, it's very important, and getting on the air is the glue that brings all of this together and coalesces everything. Okay, Jim. Copy skill. You know, there's a few challenges you go through whenever you're first learning. Um, one of them is to be careful not to overstudy, like I mentioned earlier. Um, but once you start moving through the process of learning the characters, um, one of the things I noticed through from students uh, that I was teaching was, um, and we've taught a lot of students over the years, is that they'll start to mix up their the characters that are opposite of each other. Now, for instance, uh, I have on there K, K and R. K is da da da, and R is da da dit. You know, they're the exact opposite dits and das. And I'll have students come to me and say, hey, you know, I'm mixing these things up. P and X is the same way and Y and L is the same way. And then um, I'll say, I'll get excited and I'll say, hey, no, this is great. And they say, what do you, I'll say, what do you mean that, that this is great? You know, I'm mixing this up. But really, you know, the fact that you're you're mixing up two characters that are exactly opposite of each other means that your brain is starting to file these things away, starting to organize them away. And uh, this is something you move through quickly. And uh, this doesn't last forever, but it's a common thing that people do as they're, as they're moving through. So mixing opposite characters is a is an early challenge. Same thing with uh, similar characters. Um, an H and a five. An H is four dits and a five is five dits. And now if that's coming at you slow, you might be able to, to, to differentiate that pretty easy. But when it starts coming quicker and quicker, it's a little bit tougher to pull it apart. Same thing with a six and a B and a J and a one. They're all they're very similar except for maybe one dit, uh, one one extra dit or one 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 dit, one less dit. So what we find here is it really that you work your way through that too, but um, that's just be from from exercising and listening to uh, listening to things on the air and just getting an ear for CW. Once you get an ear for it, you know in the beginning things sound a lot a lot of things sound alike. But as you start going through the program and you start learning the characters and you start practicing them and hearing them more and more often, you, you start getting an ear just like you would get an ear for music or you get an ear for another language that you're learning or even our own language. You know, we have a lot of words that sound similar and you start to learn how to pull those apart. Howard? Yeah, well, you know, even for very experienced operators, um, these similar characters at high speeds can be a problem. There, there's a call sign... A guy down in the Caribbean, it, it, it begins with 44V, and he's usually taking pileups at 40 words a minute. If you want to listen to 44V uh, and decode that, let's say you didn't really know what his call sign was ahead of time, um, that's murder to listen to, and it doesn't really matter how many years you've been on the air. So there are uh, these challenges, and, and you know you just, you just deal with it and, and move on and, and um, just enjoy what you're doing. Okay. 
Mike, you want to talk about plateaus? Sure. When learning Morse code, um, progress is not linear. Um, it's steady at first, but then there's going to be periods where there's no perceptible uh, progress. And the truth is uh, everyone uh, experiences these learning plateaus. And the key is to stay the course, continue to practice productively, and you will break through the plateaus and achieve your CW goals. Okay. I always like this plateau thing. Jim made this. It's pretty cool. Um, okay, Jim, sending. Sure. Just just like I was speaking earlier when you're starting out and you and there's challenges with receiving, there's also challenges with, with sending. Um, the main one that I see with, with uh, new students is uh, inconsistency. Um, you know, whenever you're sending uh, a, a, a character that's got three da's in it, you want all those da, da, da's to be exactly the same or close to it. And you want the dits to be um, same space, same, uh, the same dits as well. You don't want them to be, you know, you don't want to, you want to pause in between sending a character because uh, that can, that can make it sound like another character. So, and all, all that is just through practice. You know, you, you're learning I, and whenever you're first learning, you're really, th your brain is really kind of cranking these things around and trying to, you're kind of deciphering things in your head a little bit. And that can uh, cause you to kind of slow down in the middle of a character and cause some of these inconsistencies. Also, we have a, um, a challenge of spacing. Um, and one of the wisest things that I heard uh, in the club, I, Howard, you'll have to remind me who, send this, who said this once in one of our classes, but he said, you have to send a space. I mean, literally, you don't send a space, right? That's, that's why it's a space. But he says you have to think that you're sending a space in order to create that space there so that you don't forget. And um, if you don't put spaces, the proper spaces between your uh, letters within your words, um, then it's going to sound like a, a, a word is broken up into maybe two different words or it's just not going to come out right. And um, and it's the same thing um, whenever you're putting spaces in between um, and between the full words. So you put a little bit of space between the letters within a word. You put a little bit more space between between words themselves. And it's something that, of course, when you first start off, that's not natural to you. But as you work it and you practice it and you listen to it, and the more time you put in, um, that becomes a, um, a becomes normal for you to do. So it's something that you learn along the way. It's a challenge in the beginning, but it's something that uh, our students all all work through. And um, you see, we say that to relax. Um, there's a there's a picture there of an old army video where they're uh, it's no where they're teaching the um, their Morse code program to their students, and uh, and they have this big uh, wooden fist come out. And what that means is um, whenever you're nervous and whenever you're tense, your arm tightens up. And whenever you're tightened up, um, you can't send right because, you know, you imagine you need some dexterity there in your wrist whenever you're sending. And if you're all tightened up from your wrist all the way up to your elbow or maybe even up to your shoulder, you're not going to be able to send properly. It's going to sound uh, it's not going to sound very good. Um, that also goes with receiving whenever you're tense and whenever you're nervous. Um, Things that are coming at you are going to seem more intense, and you're not going to let the, you're not going to let the CW kind of flow over your brain, which is which is what you need to do. Um, so, whenever I um, spoke earlier about how we kind of combat fear, and the last thing was, um, you know, that the same thing that we do for fear is the same thing we do for help, helping people relax, and that's just building those friendships within the class. You know, you go back to the same class and you're you're with the same students. You build friendships in the beginning. You know, you're around a bunch. You know, first day of class, they're all strangers to you. You're a little bit nervous, and you don't want to send. You don't want to make mistakes in front of people. But whenever you start sending, and you and whenever you start getting to know them, and you're going back to class a few times, all of a sudden you're comfortable. You realize, hey, we're all in this together. You relax, and that helps your sending, and that also helps your receiving. And and then and then by keeping it fun, like we do, which is the main focus of our club. Um, doing fun things with our CW, that also helps people relax and that it all works towards the same goal. Howard? Yeah, uh, very well said, Jim. We have some techniques to show our, our new students uh, how to get rid of the choppiness. Um, we tell them to hang on to the dashes and accentuate them. And then even last night in our instructor meeting, uh, we were talking about um, spacing out um, what you're sending, just like I'm talking now, uh, you space things out and you give the person who's receiving uh, time to decode. So all these techniques we teach. Um, what's next, Jim? Next is 
expectation huh. management. Uh, this is a term that I learned from Jim. Um, he brought it from the Air Force, and it's uh, it, it's it's a good terminology. And tell us about it, Jim. Well, um, the expectation management. It's the way that I I'll give you an example, and that's um, you know while I was teaching. I had many students come to me on the, you know, after class or on the side and say, Hey, um, Jim, you know, I just don't, you know, even I've had some say, you know, I just, I'm just not getting it. I think I, I think I should quit. I'm not, I don't think I'm doing as good as the other students. I don't think I'm learning um, fast enough. And um, whenever I sat down to talk to them, it really turned out that these students had a much higher expectation of themselves than I did or any, anybody else would. They thought they should be farther along, but they really were right where they needed to be on, on every time I talked to somebody. And so I would sit down with them and just say, hey, look, um, and basically what it says on this slide, that it doesn't happen overnight. You're right where you need to be. Um, be patient. And remember that, you know, if you were going to go take a Spanish class, you're not going to think that you could take two weeks or three weeks of Spanish and then go out and start talking Spanish to, to everybody. You know, it takes a little bit of time. You got to not only do you got to learn the words, but you got to learn how to use them and when to use them and, you know, a little bit of the of the of the of the culture of how, of how it's used, and um, so you got to think of it that way. You're not going to learn overnight, but you will learn. And if you just take it easy, slow and steady wins the race. Said the tortoise to the hare, I think, right? And um, all in, and and if you're if you're pushing yourself so hard, and we tell this to our students all the time, if you're pushing yourself so hard that you're not having fun, you're pushing too hard. Because remember, this is a hobby. We're, the whole reason you came you came here is to have fun. That's why we're in ham radio to start with because we want to have fun. And so um, when I say expectation management, it means really talking to them and saying, hey, look, you need to have a realistic expectation of how fast you're going to learn and how fast you're going to comprehend everything. Howard? Yeah, I mean, look, if you're not having fun and your family's downstairs and they're all watching Netflix, it's calling. Netflix is calling. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, you're pushing yourself and making yourself miserable learning CW or any language is, is really not going to last too long and you're not going to achieve your goals. So uh, as Jim explained, uh, be patient and realize that it's a very personal thing and it's going to take time. Okay, Jim. All right. Before we let Mike talk about um, how we teach CW um, and the new way we do it, I just wanted to say a few words about Mike N1CC. Um, he's really the um, author of our new curriculum. Uh, there are many people now that are helping him in committees, and um, we have many dedicated instructors. But Mike took the initiative um, to get this going. We weren't exactly happy with the results we were getting, uh, the way we were teaching, and Mike took it upon himself to read every historical doc document that we could find uh, as far back as the early 1900s that had to do with CW. Um, and some of them were in German from Koch and we had them translated. And we took the best out of what was written years ago in the heyday of CW and we combined it with our own personal experience and the input from um, many of our uh, members and instructors and we came up with a new curriculum, and Mike's going to give you um, uh, an overview of this now. Um, I don't think that anybody has rewrote the way to teach CW in the past 30 or 40 years, and this was a lot of work. So, Mike, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Howard. The um, club academics reflect the uh, LICW club culture. Our uh, member interactions are uh, respectful and uh, positive, and that, of course, fosters an optimum uh, learning environment. The academics uh, directly support uh, the club's uh, mantra of uh, preparing students uh, to get on the air, but it also supports our broader goals, such as having fun and socializing and building uh, friendships and bonds around uh, shared interests and goals. We uh, work hard to develop um, optimum teaching methods, and we invest heavily in our instructor training and evaluation to ensure a consistent student experience across our 138 classes a week. And um, 
and that gives our students the best opportunity and chance for success. Um, we only select instructors that have a high degree of empathy for their students. That creates a very uh, strong and unique bond. It imbues our club membership with a sincere desire to volunteer and give back. And we call that our secret sauce. Of course, we strive for academic excellence, but the way we measure our success is by how well we prepare each of our students to achieve their goals to the best of their potential. Jim? And speaking of goals, we recommend that our students um, strive for these, to learn how to learn CW, uh, to learn how to practice uh, productively, to learn how to progress, how to get faster and achieve higher level proficiency objectives, and all while having fun. Jim? With regard to learning how to learn CW, as Howard mentioned, we read a host of historical documents and of particular interest was the 1936 report by Ludwig Koch in Leipzig, Germany. If I were to uh, summarize Koch's findings, it is that CW should be heard as single acoustic sounds and not by reference to a chart, what Koch referred to as the analytic method. And Koch came up with several innovative ways of accentuating the acoustic nature of the CW sounds. For example, he would play the CW sounds for his students without even telling the students what character those sounds were associated with. And he would ask his students to mark a piece of paper with a dot every time they heard the CW sound. For example, he would play did I did dot, did I did dot. And it wasn't until that character sound familiarity was firmly established would Koch then tell his students, did I did is an R. And from then on, students would write and verbalize the letter R, did I did R. Now we thought that was a innovative and highly effective way to introduce characters. And so we incorporated that into our beginners uh, curriculum. Koch also experimented heavily with various character speeds, and he found that characters needed to be sent at a minimum of 10 words a minute to be heard as single acoustic sounds. And he zeroed in on 12 words a minute as optimum for initial learning of CW. Now that wasn't his ultimate goal. He wanted to get his students to 20 words a minute, but the Koch method is to achieve proficiency at 12 words a minute and then ramp toward 20. And that seemed awfully consistent with our club mantra of preparing students to get on the air because most initial contacts are in that 12, 13 word per minute range. And so we adopted Koch's recommended 12 words per minute for initial learning of CW. Koch also provided significant guidance for how a sequence of characters should be built which characters could be put together, which characters should not be put together, how difficult uh, the sequence should be from beginning to end. And we took all of his recommendations and we built our own character sequence based on our CUSO protocol. The more often a letter is used in the CUSO protocol, the earlier in our sequence it appears. And what that allows us to do is to very tightly integrate CUSO protocol into our beginner's curriculum. And what that really means is, as our students are learning the CW characters, they're also learning how to communicate in CW. Jim? So once we have introduced the characters, and as per Koch's uh, guidance, we never introduce more than three characters in any one lesson, we then ask our students to send those characters on a straight key, and if they don't have a straight key, we ask them to verbalize it in what we call code talking. This is a window into the mind of our students because the way they send it or the way they verbalize it is the way they're hearing it. And if we ask our students to send the letter R and we hear dit, da, dit, then we know that they're still hearing this as separate elements, and we will work with our student until we hear them send it as did I did, did I did, 
a single acoustic sound. Once our students are, and by the way, this is one of the huge advantages of learning in a classroom environment with a live instructor. And once we know that our students are hearing the characters as single acoustic sounds, we transition into our character familiarization model. And we believe that the key to character uh, recognition or copy is to build firm uh, familiarity with the sound. And our approach is to take as long as is necessary to build that familiarity. Our web-based trainer, the LICW Morse practice page, has a lot of exercises called familiarization. And in those exercises, the student just has to sit back and relax, take a loose focus and just listen because the player will tell them what they're going to hear. This is an R and it'll play. Did I did it? Did I did it? Did I did it? This is an R. Did I did it? Did I did it? Did I did it? Some people only need a few minutes of that, others a few hours. It doesn't matter. We take as long as it takes until the sound of that character conjures up that uh, letter in our student's mind. And then we ask them to make a smooth transition into character recognition. There, the Morse practice page turns the exercise upside down. Now it plays the character in CW, did I did, and the students are asked to recognize it. That is the way LICW introduces characters. Jim? Now that you know about our character introduction, let me tell you a little bit about our curriculum uh, format. Our students um, join the club and they want to start learning code right away. But most curriculums are linear in nature. They start at a defined point with a couple of characters and then every subsequent lesson builds on that body of characters. Now that's effective from an educational standpoint, but from a practical standpoint, it means that if you don't start at the beginning or near the beginning, it's easy to feel overwhelmed and that's demotivational. So we designed the carousel concept and our beginner's curriculum is comprised of three carousels. Each carousel can be thought of as a group of standalone lessons. The carousels go round and round. Our students jump on the carousel whenever they like, they come off whenever they wish, and they progress whenever they feel they're ready. And this accommodates a broad range of student performance and student experiences. Students that are fast learners or that knew the code before and they're just brushing up, they can just zip through the carousels while students that are wanting a more relaxed approach can take two or more rotations of each carousel. It is highly effective and totally flexible. Jim? Our carousel one is comprised of six lessons where we introduce the first 18 characters. Jim? Our carousel two, nine lessons where we introduce the next 26 characters. Jim? And Carousel 3 is all about getting our students on the air. The five Carousel 3 lessons directly support our five weekly on-air activities. And each of those on-air activities is instructor-led. And the instructors literally guide our students by the hand, get them on the air in a very low stress, low anxiety environment. Jim? So now that our students have achieved proficiency at 12 words a minute with an on-air presence, it's time for them to transition into our intermediate curriculum. And as we mentioned earlier, this curriculum is a comprehensive and a structured approach to not only higher speed telegraphy, but to achieve conversational head copy proficiency. And we begin by leveraging the skills and the knowledge from the beginner's curriculum, except we get away now from the scripted formulaic type of QSO exchanges into more freeform communication, which we call fluency and fluidity. And the key to this and all other high level objectives is to uh, assume the right mental posture. We call it a relaxed state of mind or loose focus, where we just allow the code to come to us. Once we've achieved 
a level of fluency, we transition into intermediate two. And this is where we begin to increase speed. Recall the Koch method was to achieve proficiency at 12 words a minute and then ramp to 20. Well, this is where we begin that ramp. And the way we increase speed is the same way we introduce characters through character sound familiarity. But instead of becoming familiar with the sound of new characters, now we're becoming familiar with the sound of characters we already know, but at ever increasing speeds while reducing the interval of time between when they are heard and when they are recognized. The goal is quick, accurate, and effortless copy of code, what we call instant character recognition. And just as important as instant character recognition is the sister skill of instant error recovery. That's the ability to miss a character or a word and not have it negatively affect subsequent copy. Once a sufficient level of ICR and IER are achieved, we can now begin the slow ramp into head copy. And the first step is to learn how to assemble characters into words in our mind in what we call the recognition buffer. This is highly individualistic, as Howard said earlier. Some people will see ticker tapes, other people might see blackboards. Most of us don't see anything, but it doesn't matter because Intermediate 2 has a host of demonstrations, techniques, and exercises designed to build and support the mental processes and the associated buffers. Once we have learned to assemble words in our mind, we then transition into Intermediate 3, where we focus on retention of meaning or gist of what was said. This is the least understood objective in conversational head copy because it is erroneously equated to memorization and it is not memorization. It is the opposite of memorization. It's what we're doing right here, right now. You're not writing down everything that I'm saying and you're not trying to memorize everything that I'm saying. But hopefully after this conversation, you'll be able to retain the meaning or things that are of importance to you. And that is the essence of conversation. Okay, Jim, next slide. Once we've achieved ICR at about 20 words a minute, with conversational head copy skills, we transition into our advanced curriculum. And here we continue the quest for conversational head copy at ever increasing speeds. Our advanced one takes us from 20 to 25 words a minute. Our advanced two from 25 to 35 words a minute with particular focus at 28, which is very popular for higher speed QSOs. And then advanced three, our QRQ takes us into the realm of high speed telegraphy from 35 to 45 words per minute plus. And at those speeds, character by character, copy of, uh, of code becomes less and less feasible. And so here we begin to explore alternate means of copy such as instant word recognition and phonic copy. And that is an overview of LICW academics. Well, thank you very much, Mike. And I think everybody can realize how much uh, forethought went into all of this. I, I can't tell you how many hours uh, Mike spent on this and all of this is written up um, on our website under the academic section uh, which you can find on the home page uh, there's pages and pages of um, uh, reading material of of how we teach and why so we'll just uh, breeze quickly um, a little bit about the club and then we'll um, uh, go into q a if there's time uh, dan um, the uh, club is approaching 5,000 members at this point we're in 57 countries and we have a lot of teachers and instructors um, and moderators uh, totaling about 100. Um, we're running 138 classes per week on Zoom. That's per week. We've taught over 500 kids between the ages of 5 and 18 since the COVID lockdown. We run eight classes per week, and we have almost 300 YLs now, which we're very proud of, and um, they have their own group um, every Monday night. But 
um, the YLs are all involved in senior membership positions in our club. Many are instructors and leaders. Okay, Jim. Here are some of the um, non-CW, uh, well, actually it's mixed up. There's CW uh, classes and um, some of our forums. We have um, a forum every day that's in addition to uh, CW, antenna forums, anything that has to do with radio and related technology. The same thing that uh, Rat Pack does um, every Wednesday, we do uh, just about every day. And we do this to establish a community and have a place where people can come and uh, make friends and, um, and hang out, so to speak. And uh, we're more than just CW. Okay, Jim. Yeah, here's a list of uh, some of the forums that we have. Okay, Jim, next. And one of the main tenants of the Long Island CW Club is to give back to those that are not as fortunate as the majority of us are. We developed a haptic device, which you see here, which delivers CW vibrations to the palm of your hand. And this is for people who have hearing problems. And this has been very successful. It's patent pending now. And um, we are always delighted to hear the positive reviews that we get from people that have um, gotten this device from us. And it makes us feel very proud at the same time. Besides um, delivering um, CW to hard of hearing individuals, we have taught autistic adults. There was one young man who could not speak to his mother. He was um, audibly um, silent and he was able to learn CW and so did she and they were able to communicate uh, together and it's in very very inspiring the video of him sending CW to his mom can also be seen on our website under the section um, students with impairments what's next Jim yes I spoke about the kids program um, we can go ahead on that to the next slide. Why else I spoke about already. Okay, we've come to the end. Um, besides being a Star Trek fan, uh, most people know that I'm a fan of the Three Stooges. This is a great video if you haven't seen it. Um, it's what we will do to our students if they don't pay attention in class. And before you press the button, Jim, we were talking about this last night. The CW here is real 1930 CW with accentuation of the dashes as we were talking about a real fist and it's five letter characters, no vowels. It's beautiful, perfect CW, something that anybody uh, would be able to emulate today. Okay, Jim. Short wave, take it down, quick. What's it say? Ah, shut up. What'd that mean? You too? I, I love this. Now, we can't hit our students because we're all over Zoom, uh, but that's um, one of our favorite videos. So that's um, a wrap-up of our presentation. Uh, Dan, if there's any time for uh, Q&A, uh, we love that, and we'll stay as long as you'd like us to. Yes, Q&A on the board. Go ahead and take it away. You might got any questions out there? One in chat. Okay. You, you've mentioned doing people with hearing impairments and other things. How do you handle people that have physiological disabilities? They can't memorize anything. So actually, you're not supposed to memorize characters, but how do you handle that? You know, we've never had a case like that, Barry, but we have... Um, a lot of empathetic um, instructors, and if there was some individual that had that type of disability, we would bend over backwards to see what we could do, but we'd really have to experiment. So it's nothing that I could tell you right off the palm of my hand, but anybody who comes to us with disabilities, whether they're 
uh, autistic or or have any type of physical disability where they can't send, uh, we're always ready to help. That's what we're here for. And that's more important to me to be remembered for that than how many classes per week and how many members we have. All right. Great. Thank you. All I can say, live long and prosper. Thank you. Okay. Well, we got WP4A08. He's got his hand up. Go ahead. Hi, good evening to all. Uh, excellent uh, presentation from the Long Island CW Club. <clears throat> I've been an, uh, a Morse code instructor for almost uh, 45 years now. And uh, I want to make a comment that is going to help many. And it is regarding the correct or proper selection of the CW key, especially the uh, straight key when starting to transmit and, and learn how to transmit and manipulate a, a CW, manual CW key. <clears throat> and it is regarding the two different styles of straight keys. We have the British type key and we have the American type straight key. The British straight key is for the British type of sending, which is the arm not resting on the table or on the desk. So the arm on the key is moving out straight from the body of the key. We, uh, we, um, we use the American style of, of, of sending, which is the key knob closer to the desk or table. And that is why most American type straight keys have a curvature or a slight bend downward. So the knob is closer to the desk or table. That will put less stress on your wrist because American sending is with your arm resting on the desk or table and the manipulation is done with the uh, wrist, not with the complete arm, like the British style, the arm on the air. If you buy the incorrect type of key, for example, a British type key for American type of sending, you are going to be putting a lot, a lot of stress on your wrist, unless you want to send the British uh, style of sending. That is something I, I wanted to add. I don't know if uh, the instructors at the uh, uh, Long Island CW also point this out to their students. I, I believe they do because it is very important, in my opinion, to make this clarification, especially for new uh, Morse code students. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation and, and good evening to everyone. Well, thank you very much for that, Carlos, and um, I agree with you on that. Um, we have many classes um, that actually are just dedicated to sending instruction. And Jim has many keys um, and um, is involved with um, being a key holic, as we call it. <laughs> so we do take this seriously and we do show our students exactly um, what the advantages of uh, each different type of key are. Is there any other question? I think I see that Bill uh, WA2WL has a question. Bill, go ahead, please. Yes, good evening, Howard. Easy question. How do you get started with the program? Okay, if anybody would like to um, get involved with our club, um, you go to our website and there is a membership page and you click on apply for membership will give you an introduction to the club and tell you um, what the cost is uh, to go quickly. Um, a one-year membership is $30, two years is $50, um, three years is 70, nobody ever takes that. And we like to encourage everybody to go for lifetime, which is $90 because um, it's an accounting nightmare to re-up everybody um, every year um, when you have thousands of people as it is. So that's how it's structured and um, longislandcwclub.org, the membership page, click on apply for membership 
and you'll be hearing from me within 24 hours. All right, because you're talking to a life member. I just never pursued it. You were you gave a presentation at Flark in New Jersey a long time ago. I joined. I just never pursued it. Now I want to pursue it. Okay, then send me an email directly, Bill, um, and I'll reply to you and give you an LICW refresher and tell you what you're supposed to do. It's going to be a lot of reading. It's an 18-point email. You're going to be a busy man because the club has changed uh, uh, night and day since you joined. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see another question. Carol, uh, KC7CW, what a nice call sign. Please go ahead. You muted, Carol. Unmute, please. Hmm. I could question because you put it in chat, but I'm, oh, here we go. Here I am. I was on the wrong screen. So, can you help me? I, uh, I can't seem to get past about 30 words a minute. Um, I think in sound. And so when the letters come at me, to recognize the word, I sort of have to say the letters to myself. And then I recognize the word, but I can't copy and say the letters to myself at the same time. And uh, I'm kind of stuck. I can't figure out how to get past that. Well, let me tell you something, Carol. I'll turn this over to Mike in a second, but congratulations on being stuck at a 30 word per minute plateau because that's pretty darn good. And uh, you don't really need to be any higher than that uh, on the air, but uh, congratulations. But Mike, you wanna make a comment on that, please? Yeah, congratulations, Carol. You are in a great place. Uh, a lot of people would, uh, would love to be there. And you are in a really interesting uh, spot. Um, I lived the 28 word per minute uh, plateau and it took me a year and a half to get uh, uh, through it. it. It will happen. But the key really is instant character recognition. If you're having to verbalize things, then that's taking up too much time. The sound of the character and you used to conjure up what that character is. You need to hold it in your recognition buffer and go on. And it just takes effort. Our en entire intermediate and advanced uh, curricula is devoted to this specifically. We have a host of exercises for this in our classes. And you just got to get in there and you know jump in with all of us because we're all in the same boat working on the same things. But I promise you, ICR is the key to breaking through your 29 word per minute plateau. Okay, so the procedure is you join the club and then you sign up for the class? You join the club and Howard will let me know and I will take care of this personally and get you in the right class. Thank you. Well, yeah, there's no sign up for our classes. Once you're a member, you're free to take any class you want, um, even if you wanted to see a beginner's class. Uh, but you know, you'll have instructions what to do. Another thing I can tell you, Carol, but this is also a very personal thing when it comes to head copy, because like I explained before, um, I, I head copy in five different ways. We don't have time to go into it now. But anticipation and guessing what's coming, especially in a three or four stage uh, QSO uh, uh, protocol where, you know, maybe um, after you get the guy's QTH, you know, the next thing he's going to say is, is the weather and his rig, right? So anticipating all of that and knowing what the guy is going to send even before he sends it really helps you with your head copy and relaxing and seeing it. But whether you can do that or not, it's a very personal thing. But I usually know when I'm head copying what the guy's going to send even before he sends it. So I'm not even paying attention. Yeah, what I'm doing mainly for practice is I've got uh, Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility as CW. And um, the words that are, um, I tend to hear the first few words of a, letters of a word, and then I guess the word. And it's very hard not to. And when I'm guessing the word, I don't hear. And when I'm right, I'm fine. But when I'm wrong, I've missed the whole word because I just got the beginning and got it wrong. I could work with you on this because I talk about this. So when you're guessing, you have to have a ticker tape, so to speak, that has what you guess, and you have to have a check next to it. You have to visually be able to see this and cross back and forth so that you don't lose what was sent and you can make the correction. Sounds fantastic, maybe, but these things can be developed. But 
you know, you, you have to really get into the group and, and practice this and, and these mental things will, will develop as you go along, uh, hopefully. Can't guarantee it, but that's really the way it's done, Carol. Okay, I'm joining the club. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, Carl's has got his hand up again. Go ahead, Carl's. It yes, uh, one question. What is the uh, recommended amount of uh, practice time uh, for your students in terms of days, hours per week, etc., in order not to get overwhelmed with the Morse code uh, stories? My Re Koch recommended 30 minutes. Um, Any recommended 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes in the afternoon. But with modern training tools and techniques, um, those are very intense. And most of our instructors and students find about 15 minutes to be the best uh, amount of time. So if you can spend 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the afternoon in a uh, productive practice regimen, which we work hard on teaching our students uh, how to do that, that will give you very good um, uh, results. Okay, thank you, Mike. You know, I Carlos, if, if you've been teaching CW uh, uh, for years, we'd love to have you come on board, you know? No problem, I'm more than glad to do it. Uh, I started at the uh, University of Puerto Rico at the uh, early 90s uh, teaching element 1A, 1B and 1C. 5, 13, and 20 words uh, for the for a local ARRL affiliated club. And I was also a member of the uh, ARL, ARRL VEC. Uh, also, I'm still a VE for the ARRL VEC. And I am starting with classes again because there are practically nobody teaching CW here in the island. So. I decided to start a course this coming seventh uh, of May. It will last for about uh, eight to ten weeks. It's uh, every Monday from uh, eight p.m. to nine p.m. At, at least one hour. Uh, at the beginning, I was using the ARRL uh, code tapes and the ARRL method of teaching CW, but after 2007, when the uh, FCC dropped the requirement for, for Morse code on the amateur radio examinations, I started exploring other methods and I started using the Walter H. Candler system from 1904. Uh, he uh, founded a school back in 1911. I like uh, can the Candler system, the way it groups the characters. And I've been using that method for about 10 years now to teach my CW courses. But I am going to explore the Long Island CW club uh, method of teaching. So I will be very, very glad to, to join you guys and be a member of your of your club if if you want no problem yeah that'll be fine we have a number of people uh, uh from puerto rico in the club already we know all about the candler method um and you know its pros and cons as far as the way we see it um yes but you know we can all talk about this um uh later on uh carlos you know great great okay any other questions or comments I just have a quick question. Looking at the ages of the people on here, you would probably know what I'm talking about. But do you recommend using a mill? A mill. <laughs> you know, we we had some mill operators. We we have um, a handful of them in the club, and they were, um, you know, um, in the military in the 1970s, and they were copying uh, five-letter groups from Russia. And... Um, it's a different thought process, Barry. Actually, one of our advanced teachers couldn't head copy when he first came to the club because all he could do was get the CW into his fingertips automatically. There was no thought process. Mm -hmm. 
but he, right. he quickly adapted to be able to head copy. But I, I don't necessarily think um, uh, typing is the best thing to do. I think it's best to do nothing and sit there and learn how to head copy. Mm -hmm. so I had a friend who was able to copy 50 words a minute in his head while carrying on a conversation because he learned on a mill. So well, those those guys, unfortunately, are long gone, Barry. <laughs> you yeah. know? They yeah. uh, they're, they're dying off. It's it's unfortunate. Um, uh, some of the things they were able to do, but it's best just to sit down just like this, put your feet up on the desk and head copy and not write anything except what you want to put down in the log or something that you have to remember. Okay, anything? I think there was another question. I don't see your hands up. Anything there in chat, Barry? Well, we're good in chat. No, um, this is KEA KCA says his wife and him are going to try to learn CW together. She's going to want to see this presentation tomorrow after Dan puts it out, and it ought to be an adventure. Well, we have a family plan, um, okay. if you could tell her, um, that if, let's say, her husband joins, let's say he joins at Lifetime, that would be $90, and the spouse would be $45. So okay. any relative is half price if they join together, or for that matter, if they join later on. This has been great. He really has. I'm a life member also, and like the previous gentleman, I have not been active, and uh, I'm all fired up now. So I'll, you'll be seeing an email from me too, Howard. <laughs> okay. Any other um, questions or comments? It really has been a great presentation. We really appreciate you coming back and doing this. Um, I've been in, in waiting in, impatiently since we talked about this, and th this is just great. We'll have to have you come back again. It keeps growing forward. Well, um, you know, thank you very much for having us, um, Dan. It's our pleasure. You had a nice crowd. I saw that we had um, about, at, at the peak, 61 people, which is a nice turnout. Um, and I mostly stayed down to about 57 for most of the uh, uh, Q&A, too. So thank you very much for having the nice um, uh, group for us here. It's our pleasure to be a Rat Pack. We support you uh, completely. And uh, of course, Anthony KAZT is a member of our club too, and also um, an active member in your group. And um, um, we support his efforts um, 100% too. So I'll say good night from my end. Jim, you wanna say good night? I'm sorry you didn't feel the question tonight. He missed that question. <laughs> oh, I know what happened. Jim told me he had guests at his house tonight and he would be turned into chopped liver if he didn't leave on the hour. That's what it was. Okay. So, Mike, you want, to, you want to say um, something? Well, no, just good night, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. It was an absolute pleasure to be uh, here with you. And, Howard, we'll keep you up to date on, once this gets published on YouTube. We'll keep you up to date on how many people watch this offline. Okay. Thank you very much, Barry. Okay. Well, good night, everybody, and um, have a good week. All right. With all of that, I'm going to say 73 is everybody. Again, thanks. Great presentation. See you next go-round. See you down the coax or however that goes these days. <laughs>